Free Economy and Social Order by William Repke An audio Mises Daily narrated by Harold L. Fritchie This article was originally published in The Free Men, January 11, 1954. Most of us, and all of us most of the time, deal with the market economy as a definite type of economic order, a sort of economic technique as opposed to the socialist technique. For this view, it is significant that we call its constructional principle the price mechanism. Here we move in the world of prices, of markets, of supply and demand, of competition, of wage rates, of interest rates, of exchange rates, and what not. That is, of course, right and proper, as far as it goes. But there is a great danger of overlooking an important fact. The market economy as an economic order must be correlated to a certain structure of society and to a definite mental climate which is appropriate to it. The success of the market economy, wherever it has been restored in our time, most conspicuously in Western Germany, has resulted even in some socialist circles in a tendency to appropriate the market economy as a technical device capable of being built into a society which, in all other respects, is socialist. The market economy then appears as part of a comprehensive social and political system which, in its conception, is a highly centralized, colossal machinery. In that sense, there has always been a sector of market economy, also in the Soviet system, but we all realize that this sector is a mere gadget, a technical device, not a living thing. Why? Because the market economy as a field of liberty, spontaneity, and free coordination cannot thrive in a social system, which is the very opposite. That leads to my first main proposition. The market economy rests on two essential pillars, not on one alone. It assumes not only the freedom of prices and competition, whose virtues the new socialist adepts of the market economy now reluctantly acknowledge, but rests equally on the institution of private property. This property must be genuine. It must comprise all the rights of free disposal without which, as formerly in National Socialist Germany and today in Norway, it becomes an empty legal shell. To these rights must be added the right to bequeath property. Property in a free society has a double function. It means not only that the individual sphere of decision and responsibility is, as we have learned as lawyers, demarcated against other individuals, but it also means that property protects the individual sphere against the government and its ever-present tendency towards omnipotence. It is both a horizontal and a vertical boundary, and it is in this double function that property must be understood as the indispensable condition of liberty. It is curious and saddening to see how blind the average type of socialist is vis-à-vis -vis the economic, moral, and sociological functions of property and even more that particular social philosophy in which property must be rooted. In this tendency to ignore the meaning of property, socialism has made erroneous progress in our time. Traces of this may be discovered even in modern discussions on the problems of enterprise and management, which sometimes give the impression that the property owner is the forgotten man of our age. The intellectual constructions of market socialism are a good example of how the most serious fallacies ensue if we overlook the functions of private property. These fallacies can already be demonstrated on the level of ordinary economic analysis, but I wish to suggest that it is the whole social climate, the form of life and the habits of planning for life, which matter. There is a definite leftist ideology inspired by excessive social rationalism as opposed to a rightist conservative one, respecting certain things we cannot touch, weigh, or measure, but which are of sovereign importance. The real role of property cannot be understood unless we see it as one of the most important examples of something of much wider significance. It illustrates the fact that the market economy is a form of economic order that is correlated to a concept of life and a socio-moral pattern which, for want of an appropriate English or French word, we may call burgerlich, 
in the wide sense of this German word, which is largely free of the disparaging associations of the adjective bourgeois. This burgerly foundation of the market economy must be frankly acknowledged, all the more so because a century of Marxist propaganda and intellectualist romanticism has been astonishingly and alarmingly successful in spreading the parody of this concept. In fact, the market economy can thrive only as part of, and surrounded by, a burger league social order. Its place is in a society where certain elementary things are respected and are coloring the whole life of the community. Individual responsibility, respect of certain indisputable norms, the individual's honest and serious struggle to get ahead and develop his faculties, independence anchored in property, responsible planning of one's own life and that of one's family, thriftiness, enterprise, assuming well-calculated risks, the sense of workmanship, the right relation to nature and the community, the sense of continuity and tradition, the courage to brave the uncertainties of life on one's own account, the sense of the natural order of things. Those who find all this contemptible and reeking of narrow-mindedness and reaction must be seriously asked to reveal their own scale of values and to tell us what kind of values they want to defend against communism without borrowing ideas from it. That is only another way of saying that the market economy supposes a society which is the opposite of a proletarianized one, the opposite of a mass society, with its lack of a solid and necessary hierarchical structure and its corresponding sense of being uprooted. Independence, property, individual reserves, natural anchors of life, saving, thrift, responsibility, reasonable planning of life. All these are alien to such a society. They are destroyed by it, at least to the extent that they cease to give the tone to society. But we must realize that these are precisely the conditions of a durable free society. The moment has come to see clearly that this is the real watershed of social philosophies. Here the ultimate parting of ways takes place and there is no getting around the fact that the concepts and patterns of life which clash against each other in this field are decisive for the fate of society and that they are irreconcilable. Once we admit this, we must be prepared to see its significance in every field and to draw the corresponding conclusions. It is indeed remarkable to see how far we are already drawn into the habits of thinking of an essentially unburgerlicht world. That is a fact which the economists also ought to take to heart, for they are among the worst sinners. Enchanted by the elegance of a certain type of analysis, how often we discuss the problems of aggregate savings and investments, the hydraulics of income flows, the attraction of vast schemes of economic stabilization and of social security, the beauties of advertising or installment credits, the advantages of functional public finance, the progress of giant enterprise and what not, without realizing that in doing so we take for granted a society which is already largely deprived of those burglarly conditions and habits which I described. It is shocking to think how far our minds are already moving in terms of a proletarianized, mechanized, centralized mass society. It has become almost impossible for us to reason other than in terms of income and expenditure of input and output, having forgotten to think in terms of property. That is, by the way, the deepest reason for my own fundamental and insurmountable distrust in Keynesian and post-Keynesian economics. It is indeed highly significant that Keynes attained fame mostly for his trite and cynical remark that, in the long run, we are all dead. And it is even more significant that so many contemporary economists have found this dictum particularly spiritual and progressive. But let us remember that it only echoes the slogan of the Ancien Regime in the 18th century, Après na le déluge. And let us ask why this is so significant. Because it reveals the decidedly un the bohemian spirit of this modern trend in economics and in economic policy. It betrays the new hard-boiled happy-go-luckiness 
the tendency to live from hand to mouth and to make the style of the bohemian the new watchword for a more enlightened generation to incur debts becomes a positive virtue to save a capital sin to live beyond one's means as individuals and as nations is the logical consequence but what else is this than entburgerlichen deracination proletarization nomadization and is not this the very opposite of our concept of civilization, which is derived from Sibis, the burger? Muddling through from day to day and from one expedient to another to boast that money does not matter, that is indeed the opposite of an honest, disciplined, and orderly concept and plan of life. The income of people living on these lines may have become burgerly, but their style of life is still proletarian. It is clearly impossible in the space of a short article to study the impact of all this in all the important fields. I have discussed it in regards to private property. It is further very disquieting to see how this concept has permeated more and more the economic and social policies of our time. One major example is co-determination the right of workers and trade union representatives to participate in the administration of industrial enterprises and thus to take over some functions of proper ownership in West Germany. To give an illustration, the director of a large power plant in Germany tells me how silly he felt the other day when, in wage negotiations with trade union officials, he had to deal with the same men who at the same time sit beside him at meetings of trustees of the power plants themselves. He adds that the structure of enterprises in West Germany approaches more and more that which Tito seems to have in mind and that is happening in the very country which is considered today the model of a successful restoration of the free market economy. Another example of this gradual dissolution of the meaning of property and of the corresponding norms which can be observed in many countries is the softening of the responsibility of the debtor. By lax legal procedures with regards to execution and bankruptcy, this more often than not amounts, in the name of social justice, to the expropriation of the creditor. It is hardly necessary to recall in this connection the expropriation of the hapless class of house owners by rent control and the effects of progressive taxation. Let us apply our reflections to another most important field, money. Let us recognize that respect for money as something intangible is like property an essential part of the social order and of the mentality which are the prerequisites of the market economy. To illustrate my case, I want to tell two stories which I take from the financial history of France. At the end of 1870, Gambetta, the leader of the French resistance after the defeat of the Second Empire, left the besieged capital in a balloon for tours to create the new Republican army. In his desperate need for money, he remembered that his admired predecessors of the Revolution had financed their wars by printing and assignats. He asked the representative of the Banque de France to print for him a few hundred million notes, but he met with a flat and indignant refusal. At that time, such a demand was considered so monstrous that Gambetta did not insist. The Jacobin firebrand and all-powerful dictator yielded to the determined no of the representative of the central bank who would not accept even a supreme national emergency as an excuse for the crime of inflation. A few months later, the socialist revolt known as the Commune occurred in Paris. The gold reserves and the plates of the notes of the Banque de France were at the mercy of the revolutionaries. But badly in need of money and politically unscrupulous as they were, they strongly resisted the temptation to lay their hands on them. In the very midst of the flames of civil war, the central bank and its money were sacrosanct to them. The significance of these two stories will not escape anyone. It would indeed be harsh to ask what has become of this respect for money in our time, not least of all in France. To restore this respect and the corresponding discipline in money and credit policy is one of the most important conditions for the durable success of all our efforts to restore and maintain a free economy and therewith a free society. 
The Ludwig von Mises Institute hopes you have enjoyed this audio Mises Daily. For a world of free market literature, media, and discussion, visit Mises.org.